Good morning, everyone, and welcome to peer worship here on virtual space for First Congregational Church. It is the second Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of Peace, and I just have a couple of announcements. The first is that we will be having our virtual coffee hour following worship today, and so if you are able to join us, we'll take a brief break between worship and coffee hour, and then we hope you'll join us for more community and conversation. And also a reminder that it is December, and so we are um, collecting funds for what is now called the Christmas Fund. It used to be called the Veterans of the Cross, and it's one of the UCC Five for Five uh, offerings in the year. And it specifically helps those who are either um, retired clergy or um, widows or widowers of clergy, um, especially with medical expenses. And so we invite you, if you are so moved, to give to that um, important fund. And as we begin worship, I begin with a First Peoples Land acknowledgement. We want to acknowledge that we gather as First Congregational Church on the traditional land of the Wabanaki Confederacy, the Abenaki people and the Penacook people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself, and the people who have stewarded it throughout a thousand generations. This calls us to commit to learning, to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of this land that we inhabit as well. And with that, dear friends, I invite you to join with me as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship as we listen to our prelude. Thank you, Adele. And I invite us now to take a moment of silence to set our intentions for worship this morning, remembering that an intention is essentially a focus. And so I invite you in this moment to choose a focus for yourself for worship. Amen. I invite you, if you have it in front of you, to join with me in our call to worship for this morning. I will read all of the words and I invite you to join with me on the bolded print. When does an ordinary life become extraordinary? When does a mundane day become revolutionary? When does a moment in time change history? When God enters in, forgives sin, and allows us to begin again. When we repeat those words of Mary, may it be to me as you say. And let us continue by bringing ourselves into God's presence together. Loving Lord, when we have strayed, you have called us to come home to you. Return to me with all your heart. With all our hearts, we return to you and gratefully accept your gentle love for the sake of the one whose spirit lives in us, Jesus Christ, amen. And I now invite you to join with me in singing our opening hymn, Once in Royal David City, just a reminder that the hymn uh, lyrics are from the Trinity Psalter hymnal. But if you'd like to follow along with the music in the New Century Hymnal, that is on page 145. And I invite you to sing whatever lyrics speak to your heart this morning, or no one can hear you <laughs> except the people with you. 
Adele, when you are ready. Now I'd like to invite Sarah Nichols to unmute, who will be leading us in our lighting of the Advent wreath. And I invite you to join with me on the bolded print. In our homes, we gather around wreaths to pray for our lost hopes, broken peace, limited joys, and love so hard to find and share in this season of coronavirus. We affirm that these candles mean that this is the season, Advent, when God's love comes into the world and nothing can overcome it. We relight the candle of hope. We now light the candle of peace. In spite of gun violence, anger, post-election violence, dangerous homes, depression, and addiction. God's peace illuminates the possibility of reconciliation and healing and brightens the path to joy. Emmanuel, God be with us in the week to come, lighting hope and peace on the wick of our lives, so that we may shine on in our world. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. I would now invite Linda Sims to unmute and share with us our gospel lesson for this morning. Our gospel lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great 
and he will be called the Son of Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called Son of God. And now your relative, Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is a sixth month for her, who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This ends our gospel lesson for today. Thank you, Linda. Dear friends, I have embarked on something a little different for our time of sermon this morning. I'm going to do a brief reflection on the scripture passage and close that with a, um, a reading, a sh short reading by Joan Chittister. And then I thought rather than just talking about peace, um, I would invite us into a space of being together in peace with a guided meditation. So this is probably the first time I think I've ever had the chance to reflect on this particular passage of scripture on the Sunday of peace. It's not usually used um, if it's used until um, really closer to, the, the, to Christmas Eve or on Christmas Eve. And so in reflecting about this specifically with peace, it suddenly struck me that that's what I find in her final words that, you know, during this conversation, and there's a part of me that thinks that this was a longer conversation than, you know, it feels like in the scripture. I mean, it may have been even all night long with Perry going, okay, I need you to explain this to me again. What is happening here? And how is this going to happen? Because this is not anything I've ever heard of, nor is it something that makes sense in my logical mind. But she gets to that point where there's, I think, a peace that really descends upon her and upon her heart. And she fully embodies that promise that nothing will be impossible with God. And I find in her words, a new sense of peace, not just sort of resigning, but just that deep embodiment of, yes, this is possible. Nothing is impossible with God. And I am willing to take this on for my people that this isn't just about her welcoming God into herself for herself, but I think there's a space, especially as we move through the scriptures in the next couple of weeks to her Magnificat, where she really understands even in this moment that what God is doing is for all people. And I think that for me, that is a large part of where her peace comes from. And this section of reading from Joan Chittister I wanna share with you speaks to that for me. This is actually, um, the, um, I've forgotten the word now, at the beginning of a book, when, when you say thank you to people for, <laughs> in the writing of, the dedication, thank you. Uh, the dedication of her new book, The Time Is Now, A Call to Uncommon Courage. And I know she didn't write it about Mary, but something about this, her words, and the words of our scripture passage this morning really spoke together for me. So here's the words from Joan Chittister. In all my years of traveling around the world, one thing has been present in every region everywhere. One thing has stood out and convinced me of a certain triumph of the great human gamble on equity and justice. Everywhere there are people who, despite finding themselves mired in periods of national darkness or personal marginalization, refuse to give up the thought of a better future or give in to the allurements of a deteriorating present. They never lose hope that the values they learned in the time, the best of times, or the courage it takes to reclaim their world from the worst of times are worth the commitment of their lives. These people, the best of ourselves, are everywhere. It is the unwavering faith, the open hearts, and the piercing courage of people from every level of every society that carries us through every major social breakdown to the emergence again of the humanization of humanity. In every region, everywhere, they are the unsung but mighty voices of community, 
high-mindedness, and deep resolve. They are the prophets of each era who prod the rest of the world into seeing newly what it means to be fully alive, personally, nationally, and spiritually. It is to these average but courageous people who forever seek the truth, defend the weak, bring the peace, and always, always, always stand up to protest injustice, it is to you that I dedicate this book. And so I'd like to invite us into a space together of being in peace. This particular guided meditation uh, comes from a woman named Susan Posnecker. And I invite you to be in comfortable in whatever way works for you. Some people like to have their feet on the floor if they aren't currently. Some people like to tuck their feet up, whatever is comfortable for you. If you would like to close your eyes, I invite you to do that, but you don't have to. And I also invite if you would like um, to turn off your video if that speaks to you, but you don't have to do that either. I will ring the bell to begin and I will ring the bell to close so you don't have to worry whether or not um, I'm moving into the next section of worship. Let us be now together in a time of peace. I invite you to close your eyes or soften your gaze and to take a deep breath. And to let it out slowly and to breathe in again. You are sitting on a log in a beautiful forest clearing. The log is currently rough and cold. The air is cold and maybe freezing as it is winter time. As you breathe in and out, you feel the cold air pull deep inside of you. You feel bits of snow falling gently against your skin. Everything is silent around you. You are silent too. Your mind is silent. Your breathing is silent. Your thoughts are silent. You feel yourself as one with the winter night. A deep peacefulness comes over you. And you sit quietly for some time feeling this peaceful quiet. Still enfolded in silence, you become aware of a sensation deep within you. It is the smallest hint of warmth, as if a candle was flickering deep inside. You focus on the warmth. It isn't yet enough to create actual heat, but it is real. As you wait, the warmth begins to grow steadily. You imagine a tiny ball of warmth and light inside you. Now it is about the size of a walnut. And now as it grows, it is the size of a small orange. And now the size of a grapefruit. You feel it hum. It feels alive. It feels wonderful. It fills you with warmth and you sit with it, basking in how good it feels. 
you feel warm and completely safe. You become aware of the log you're sitting on, which no longer feels rough and cold, but now feels warm and inviting. The air around you feels warmer too. The air you pull in and out, in and out of your lungs is gently warm. Without looking, you become aware that there are other logs around you and that others sit on those logs just as you sit on yours. Without looking, you know that these are your loved ones. You can see each of their faces, past and present. You smile. Then you pull back to focus again on long, slow, warm breaths. You become aware that all of the logs are arranged in a circle around a great fire pit. A huge pile of wood is arranged in the pit, but the pile is currently silent. As you keep breathing silently in and out, you become aware of a small bit of light in the center of the wood pile. It's as if the small flame that once burned within you has now found its way into the wood. As you breathe in and out, it's as if your breath feeds the flame when you breathe in, the tiny flame rises up a little higher each time. When you breathe out, the flame pushes away momentarily and then rushes up again, in and out, in and out. The flame begins to grow. You can hear the wood hissing and crackling as it catches fire. The fire grows. Soon the fire pit is alive with light and sound. Your breathing picks up slightly from excitement. You can feel the heat coming from the fire for it warms your face and makes you feel alive. You reach your hands out toward the fire and imagine the warmth filling you with life and energy. And you're aware of your loved ones doing the same. Together with them, a circle of energy surrounds the bonfire and courses through you. Your heart and your soul sing with energy. As you experience this, as you feel the light and the energy and the joy, the scene is suddenly rent by a shard of light from a Christmas star. And even the fire cannot compete with the star's brilliance. Holding this scene in your mind I invite you to take three more slow, deep breaths. And when you are ready, I invite you to reopen your eyes.
Amen. I invite you to join me now in singing our next hymn in the bleak midwinter. The lyrics are from the United Methodist hymnal that are printed in the bulletin, but I invite you to use either those or what is printed in the New Century hymnal, which is number 128. Adele, when you are ready. Invite us now into a time of prayer and community where first we'll hold a moment of silence together and then I will invite folks to unmute as you feel called to share with us your prayers of joys and your prayers of concern. Let us be now together in a spirit of prayer. God of peace, which passes all understanding, we ask that you hear now the prayers that we have brought with us this morning. Prayers for Ellie Wells and her family. Lord, hear our prayer. Prayers of joy and, and appreciation for all the people who have contributed so much to the major job of moving our furniture into the storage areas. Lord, hear our prayer. Okay. 
prayer for the youth of our state, our country, and the world who are dealing with losses that seem magnanimous or huge or overwhelming. And the answer or the response, so limited. Lord, hear our prayer. To the people in California who are not only affected by coronavirus, but also with the fires that are devastating their neighborhood. Lord, hear our prayer. I ask the thanks for the folks from South Church who have brought food to us and offloaded some of Bill's responsibility of trying to cook for the family. I appreciate it very much. And the phone calls too. Lord, hear our prayer. As we continue our time of prayer, I invite you to join with me in singing the second verse of Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silent, if you are so moved. King of kings, yet born of Mary, as of old on earth he stood, Lord of lords in human vesture, in the body and the blood, he will give to all the faithful his own self for heavenly food. I will share my screen now to share our pastoral prayer as written by Reverend Dr. Sheila Harvey Gilumi. In the sacredness of the moment, we anticipate the silence of the night, the holy birth of God's grace and love, whose peace will be our guiding light. Living day by day with uncertainty, our nights hold our fears and grief as we long for the promised Christ child whose peace will be our sorrow's relief. And with fragile hearts open wide, we acknowledge our brokenness while remaining encouraged by our faith for Emmanuel's peace to be with us. As the beloved who seek justice, we hear the rallying cry of the oppressed, and we respond by mourning together with faithful efforts of peaceful protest. Trusting the many ways that God speaks, seeking to understand all people of God, and listening to the diversity of creation by believing God's peace is birthed for all. And with great reverence and humility, we embrace Christ's everlasting love as peace was made possible for humanity when Christ came to us from above. Now I invite you to join with me in our saying our Lord's Prayer together as is printed in our bulletin. O oh, birther, father, mother of the cosmos, focus your light within us. 
make it useful. Create your reign of unity now through our fiery hearts and willing hands. Help us love beyond our ideals and sprout acts of compassion for all creatures. Animate the earth within us. We then feel the wisdom underneath supporting all. Untangle the knots within so that we can mend our hearts simple ties to each other. Don't let surface things delude us, but free us from what holds us back from our true purpose. Out of you, the astonishing fire, returning light and sound to the cosmos. Amen. Dear friends, we now begin our ritual of what is normally the time when we hang our chrismons. As you all know, we are not in a normal time, but we can hold space for sim symbolism in this ritual space. And so I invite Sheila Swenson to unmute and to share with us the meaning of and our history of hanging chrismons. And then we will share together in a ritual of that moment. Good morning. First Congregational Church has a wonderful 35 year plus tradition of decorating uh, a, a Christmas tree in our sanctuary during the Advent season. This tradition began in the early 1980s with our pastor emeritus, Reverend Donald Jennings. Simple paper ornaments were made each year during the Advent Fellowship Workshop and later by the children and youth of our church school. The ornaments reflected the, <clears throat> the symbols of that particular year's Advent scripture readings. The congregation would bring the ornaments forward to place on a live tree during the worship service with the singing of the Advent songs and Christmas carols. In 2007, our former pastor, David Keller, asked us to consider creating permanent chrismon ornaments to decorate the new sanctuary tree given by the family in the memory of Jim Ordway, a longtime member of First Church. Chrismons are handcrafted tree ornaments that symbolize the life of Jesus Christ and Christianity. The name Chrismon comes from a combination of two words, Christ and monogram, which means symbol. The word was first coined in 1957 by a woman named Frances Spencer from the Ascension Lutheran Church in Danville, Virginia. She was a crafter and was asked to make decorations for her church Christmas tree. Mrs. Spencer handcrafted her ornaments as monograms of Christ in the liturgical colors of Christmas which are white and gold. The color white symbolizes innocence, purity, perfection, and joy. The color gold symbolizes the, gl the glory of God, the majesty and triumph of the Son of God. What started as one local church's Christmas project, chrismons are now crafted nationwide in churches of many faith traditions. To, pre to preserve the tradition of Francis Spencer's understanding of a chrismon, it should be a handmade ornament given as a gift from the heart. In 2007, it seemed a fitting tribute for the Swenson family to get to dedicate the initial handcrafted chrismons in memory of my mother-in-law, Barbara Swenson, a 50 year member of First Church who died the previous year. Barbara was a talented crafter who, enc who encouraged the crafting traditions of this church and benefited the Women's Guild Fair and many various ministries of First Church. Over a hundred Christmas ornaments were cut from specialized pearlized paper. And then we asked our church family to help us trim the chrismons with gold accents at a special advent workshop. Eight Christ symbols were chosen that first year and continue to be hung on our sanctuary tree each year. The chrismons were a cross, a natal star, the Christ child in a manger, a lamb, a crown, a dove of peace a symbol of the Trinity, and a chai ro, the first two Greek letters that stood as a symbol of Christ. Over the past 13 years, our church family has been invited to craft additional chrismons that were often given in memory of their loved one. Their handcrafted chrismon ornaments, given as gifts from their hearts, have added to the collection of chrismon ornaments that have hung on our first church tree each year. During this year of virtual worship services, the Spiritual Life Ministry team invites our congregation to handcraft a chrismon ornament this week or during the month of December to hang on, on your tree in your own home. 
Pastor Amelia continues to honor our first church tradition by the hanging of chrismons, the white and gold ornaments to honor Christ in the season of Advent and Christmas. Thank you, Pastor Amelia, for continuing that tradition this year. Thank you very much, Sheila, for sharing that. And I will um, now hang four representative um, chrismons on my tree here. And I invite you to um, follow Tim, who's going to lead us in singing our hymn, Lo How a Rose They're Blooming. Tim, if you are still willing to do that. <laughs> All right, Adele will play through the hymn for us first. Um, and then again, I invite you to, to join in as I hang the ornaments. Dell, when you're ready. Thank you to Tim and Carol and Jim for that lovely singing and harmony. And now, dear friends, I invite you to join with me in the blessing of our chrismons, both the ones that are present in this moment, but the ones that we also hold in our hearts. Saying together, O oh Christ, our shield, our guardian, each day, each night, each light, each dark, be near us, uphold us, our treasure, our triumph. Amen. And now I invite you to join with me in singing our closing hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And Adele will play through the melody for us first. When you are ready, Adele.
Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, feel the incarnate deity, pleased with all sin flesh to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that we no more may die, born to raise us from the earth, born to give us second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Amen. Let us take a moment of silence to set our intentions for the week ahead. Or depending on where your heart is for the day ahead, or even just for the hour ahead. May it be so for each of us. I now invite you to join with me in our responsive benediction and sending, I invite you to join with me on the bolded print. Lord God, you choose the very least and raise them up to greatness, for nothing is impossible with God. You take the weak, the impoverished, and the blind and raise them into the light, for nothing is impossible with God. Give thanks to the Lord, our God is good. God's love endures forever. Teach us obedience, Lord, in every part of our lives. Ears to hear your word, hands to do your work, feet to walk your path, a heart for all your people, a mouth to shout your praise, a childlike faith and confidence that says to the possible and the impossible alike, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Our worship is ended. Our service now begins. Amen. And we conclude this morning with our postlude. Adele, when you are ready. Thank you, Adele. Blessings to all and each of you, whether you are going or staying, I invite you to do so in peace. Blessings to all of you this week. May it be filled with the peace of Christ. We will see you again next week. God bless.